we're going to start this statistical description off by imagining uh, making a little model of our polymer chain. So we're going to assume what's referred to as the freely jointed chain model. So if we imagine our chain as this ball stick model, uh, we know we have free rotation there's about the carbon-carbon bond, but this ball stick model requires us to maintain a constant uh, 109.5 carbon-carbon bond angle. Now, what we're uh, eventually going to do is we're going to simplify this. We're going to assume that this chain is completely freely jointed, right? There's no, there's not going to be any restriction uh, on the bond angle uh, um, between, right? And what we want to do is calculate the number of molecular configuration. So if my end of my, one end of my chain is at the origin and my other end of my chain is at some point in space, I want to calculate the number of possible ways that a chain of a given length can go through space uh, and maintain these uh, endpoints. We're also going to make one more big assumption, other than the chain is freely jointed, we're going to assume that there's no change in internal energy between the different molecular configurations uh, along the chain. So. So let's consider a freely jointed chain with n mers, right, or n carbon-carbon bonds um, between crosslinks, right? So each link uh, can be thought of as an independent 3D vector L, right? So again, freely jointed. We're assuming that that the uh, Um, you're not restricted by that 109.5 uh, carbon-carbon bond restriction, right? So the magnitude of the vector is given by L, right? And the length of this chain um, in an arbitrary conformation is, is given by the sum over all the, the lengths, right? So for a large number of chains... Right? Now, this is for a single chain. Now we're extending this to a whole bunch of chains. The mean change length is just the, the uh, arithmetic mean of the uh, individual chains. Right? Now, obviously this is going to be zero, right? Because I'm going to have change pointing in all different directions, right? So if I average over them, I'm going to have uh, um, a, a zero average chain length. So what I need to do is start thinking about the mean square chain chain length, right? So this is the average value of the length squared, which is over. This is Q is over all the chains. Now N is over all the different MERS, so here our, sum, our square is on the outside of this summation. So let's expand this out. So we have a huge polynomial expansion here. Huh. So we have a huge polynomial expansion over all these chains. And these, uh, we can make, we have all these terms that are uh, the, the length of all the individual MERS is equal, 
and we're assuming here that the the lengths the average of the cross lengths are going to be zero for all m and n right which basically this is just saying that on average if i take the dot product right each of these are independent uh vectors pointing in space right no matter which way i've got a vector this way i've got a vector going this way if i take a whole bunch of random vectors in space and i do their dot products and sum up their dot products the average the the expectation expectation after doing that sum is going to be zero right so if all of the links this is the freely jointed chain approximation here if all the links are are considered as random vectors then this product has to be zero so our mean squared chain length just becomes the number of mers times the uh, the length of each um, mer squared right and then we can take the wow emails coming in like crazy not not a single one like not a single email all day when I'm not recording but when I'm recording I get tons and tons and tons of them uh, I suppose it's my fault for not shutting it off all right so we take the square root of this right the length of each chain the length of each link uh, right times the square root of n and this is our RMS expected chain length right so that means if we have a chain of a hundred bonds or MERS between cross links right the average extension between cross links is going to be 10 10 bond lengths, right? So the, the chain will take some strange configuration in space. It'll zigzag like this, but the average end-to-end -end distance is going to be the square root of the number of, of uh, MERS that you have in your system, or the number of carbon-carbon bonds that you have between these cross links. And the cross links are basically fixed in space. Okay. So... Let's get a little deeper into this and talk about how we applying this to, to random walk theory. So, Flory, as far as I'm concerned, this is the, the guy, um, he was like the polymer king. He figured everything out. Polymer solution theory, Flory Huggins, all that stuff uh, came from him. And so as a mechanics person, this is uh, everything, everything I know about polymers comes from Flory. And he was his real genius, I think, was was describing the free volume theory for polymers, uh, which is how I tend to imagine all polymer problems is the the amount of free volume in the polymer system. But he proposed that the occupied volume exclusion for an isolated chain is. Uh, exactly balanced in the bulk state by the external environment in in similar chains and that the in the similar uh, that this exclusion factor can be ignored in uh, uh, solid state right so not for dilute solutions okay so what does this uh, this mean basically all as he's saying is all the chains are seeing a very similar local neighborhood so you can think about each chain independently rather by, than by needing to consider uh, um, all of the chains in a uh, in the in the solid right um, and also that the the external neighborhood doesn't affect Things, right? Obviously, that's not going to be the same, right? That's not going to be true for uh, for dilute solutions. So what Flory did is said, let's consider this chain is a, a a random walk, and uh, 
for a 3D, for a random, pure random walk process, we know that the distribution of distances from the origin is going to be uh, Gaussian. All right. So if we consider a chain of n lengths, each of length l, if one end of the chain is at the origin and the other end is at some position q, right, denoted by x, y, z, the probability that q is at x, of the probability of finding q at point x, y, z is given by uh, this Gaussian relationship where b squared is going to be 3 halves n l squared. So this goes back to our, uh, our chain uh, um, our RMS chain distance right here. Okay, so what P, X, Y, Z does, it doesn't give you the probability of end-to-end -end distances though. Right, so here's P, it's a Gaussian with respect to space, this is our radius, right? But what, what this fails to take into account is that um, R, if we consider R as a radius, right, a um, volleyball has a lot more surface area than a golf ball, right? So uh, a concent we have to correct by the volume of these concentric shells as we go out, right? Um, as we make our... our as we build up our space by these infinitesimally thin shells, right, this gives the probability of a chain landing somewhere, the end of a chain landing somewhere in that, that infinitesimal, on that infinitesimal ball surface, but we need to uh, correct that for the uh, 4 pi r squared dr, which is the volume of that uh, that infant, that uh, thin shell, right? 4 pi r squared is the surface area, dr is the thickness of that shell. So this gives us an overall probability that looks like this, which is uh, um, heavy tailed to the right, right? So it's now a skewed distribution. All right? And again, we recover our uh, expected RMS. Uh, we look at the expected RMS chain length from this distribution, we, we recover it. So we're all good with our analysis on the previous and here lineup. Okay, so that gives us the probability of end to end distances. So now we want to write the entropy uh, as a function of that end to end distance, right? So the, the entropy of a, a joint of a chain is going to be proportional to the log of the number of configurations, right? This is good old-fashioned Boltzmann, right? You should be, uh, be familiar. So if this is constant, the number of configurations is proportional uh, to p x y z, all right? If we plug that in, take the log of that, we end up with the entropy of a single chain is uh, equal to c minus k b squared r squared. C is the zero arbitrary constant, right? Because we're always interested in entropy changes. We don't have a way of setting the absolute entropy. Um, or in terms of the uh, position in space, x, y, and z. Right? So this gives us the entropy of a single chain. Okay. So to get to the elasticity of a polymer network, right, we want to compute the strain energy function, uh, which is given by the change in entropy over a whole network of chains as a function of the strain. So we're going to assume that each segment of the polymer 
chain between succe successive cross link, which is not chord linkage. Dang it! I keep, every year I keep finding new mistakes and correcting them. Um, so we're going to consider this to be a Gaussian chain. We're going to assume three additional assumptions that the junctions or the cross links are regarded as fixed in its average position, right? Our cross links don't don't move. Um, they only move by our average deformation, right? The vector length of each chain change with deformation in, is in the same ratio of the dimensions of the bulk material, right? And uh, we're going to assume that the RMS chain length for our whole ensemble of chains is, is the same as if they were individual independent free chains. So we're going to keep one end fixed at the origin. The other end deforms from Q to Q prime, right? This is our stretch ratios for that deformation. And plugging back into our entropy for a single change chain, we can uh, derive this as the form for the change in entropy for, the, for that particular chain. And then, because it's kind of nasty um, and takes a lot of time without adding any real understanding behind it, uh, I'm just going to present the change in entropy for the entire polymer network, right? We can sum this over all the chains, uh, and we get a relationship that looks like this, right? And look, lo and behold... That's our Neo-Hookian, right? This is nothing but our strain energy density function. Uh, our simple strain energy function that we came up with from uh, um, Neo, their Neo-Hookian behavior. In that case, we just said, let's just pick the simplest possible uh, relationship. And this is what we chose. So basically, the assumptions of a freely jointed Gaussian chain lead you back to that Neo-Hookian behavior. So, right, assuming the strain energy function is zero in the undeformed state, and going back to our definition for the Helmholtz free energy, we have our strain energy is given by our change in the Helmholtz free energy which is given here. We take our derivatives. We end up back here. For small strains, right, if we assume that our strains are very small, lambda is significantly, uh, is very close to one, we end up uh, with a linear behavior. Right? If we assume that we're uncompressed, that are non-compressible, our Young's modulus is about three times our shear modulus. Uh, so we end up with a shear modulus uh, for polymers that's NKT. Or we can, uh, this is the number of... Uh, the number of chains that we have, we can relate that with respect to the uh, the molecular weight of the polymer chains between cross uh, cross links in this way, right? So from so what have we done here, right? We've gone through a lot of kind of nasty math, but let's not get get sidetracked. We made some really simple assumptions about how a polymer chain behaves. And we can consider that as a statistical process. We derived a form for the problem. We made an assumption that the chain lengths are Gaussian, Ga uh, are distributed by, uh, follow a Gaussian distribution. And from those assumptions, we were able to calculate the, the expected entropy change for a single chain the expected entropy change for a whole network of chains, 
from our thermodynamic analysis that we did at the beginning, where we said that uh, we really only our our strain energy is going to be directly related to our Helmholtz free energy. We uh, were able to work up a relationship between force and displacement and a form for the shear modulus of our polymers from small strains, all from a purely statistical mechanics point of view. Now, uh, the number of chains in our system, right, number of uh, cross links, they, this is, is not very well behind defined, right? Junction points can be permanent cross-links or temporary chain entanglements, right? And not all cross-links in our system have the same effectiveness. We have loose loose ends um, and loops, right? Obviously, uh, how do we describe the distance between cross-links of a loop or a free chain? And we, we know we assume that ro a free rotation of our chains, um, which we we know is a big assumption. So there's models out there that, that take bond angle and steric hindrance or other more advanced effects into account. And those go into a lot more advanced random walk statistics that we're going to talk about. But the general process is the same. It's just they're working through the random walk model with different sets of assumptions, more restrictive assumptions, which means that a lot of stuff doesn't cancel out the way it did for us. So if we remove the assumption of Gaussian statistics, you get the Kuhn, Kuhn and Grun model, right, where uh, you have a, the probability follows this kind of nasty probability, probability relationship um, where this, this L, the Lorentzian function it's called, is equal to this, co this, this nasty, uh, hyperbolic uh, trigonometric function here and we end up with a force relationship that is quite a bit more complicated and looks like this where we have to consider the inverse of this this uh, function right but if we remove that assumption we get a much closer behavior for extreme uh, extreme stretches for the uh, uh, for the theories so basically the the takeaway message is here is that the more the more you stretch the more you get away from Gaussian Gaussian chain behavior and there's been um, uh, a lot of uh, advances right so one of the key things you notice this this theory, this Kuhn and Guth or James and Guth theory, is that it doesn't, it over predicts the stiffness in the very initial region, right, that Gaussian does, uh, that Gaussian gets right, um, but Gaussian drastically under predicts the, the long term behavior. This is called Mooney softening, is the term that people apply to it. Um, and so this James and Guth theory uh, doesn't capture that Mooney softening. So it really works much better for large strains and small strains. In the 80s, Ball, Doy, Edwards, and Warner, they did a random walk where they considered cross links and slip links in their system uh, so that the chain links had certain probabilities of changing lengths. Uh, and uh, that did it more recently. Um, uh, Mary Boyce at MIT, uh, now the dean at uh, Columbia of Engineering, the first female dean that they've had there, um, and a huge force in uh, um, the solid mechanics world. Um, She's very likely to be the first woman to win the Timoshenko Medal, which is a, a 
award given to someone who's had the biggest impact across their career in the field of solid mechanics. A lot of people, including myself, are very upset that she hasn't received that award yet. She would be the first, the first woman to receive that uh, award, especially considering how underrepresented solid mechanics is with respect to, uh, to contributions made by uh, by women. It's a shame that that she hasn't been honored in that way. But she made a very famous. Um, generalization to the James and Guth theory and she considered eight chains intersecting at the corners of a cube and attached at the center um, and this not only captures the that Mooney softening but it also captures biaxial behavior and you'll you'll read a um, uh, a paper written by Boyce a review of constitutive models for rubber elasticity uh, as part of the assigned reading so that's it for nonlinear rubber elasticity. We'll pick this back up with uh, um, viscoelasticity.